It's Camp Meeting USA. Join us in the spirit of camp meetings of long ago. From the grounds of Heritage USA, we bring you the greatest evangelists and teachers of our time. Share in worship and praise with a variety of today's finest Christian groups and singers. And now, Camp Meeting USA. James Blackwood, give him a good welcome to camp meeting. God bless you. What a joy it is to see you here. I guess the, the, the biggest camp meeting service in the world because we're reaching millions of homes with this great service, and we're glad that you've tuned in and can be a part of this. James Blackwood's going to be back, and we have evangelist Paul Olson here is our camp evangelist. Give him a great welcome to Camp Meeting USA. He's going to be ministering the word in just a little bit, and it's going to be a great course. I believe we serve a God that is so good. And if you have not tasted of the Lord to find out how good he is, I think you ought to do it now. Well, we're so happy, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, at this great camp meeting service to have James Blackwood with us. You know, James Blackwood is, is just really kind of a legend. Uh, many times the uh, 
male vocalist, Dove Award given to him year after year, and has been a part of the, the great singing Blackwood Brothers for so many years, the only living original Blackwood Brother, and uh, now has embarked on a new ministry for him, not quartet singing anymore, but just really solo singing to magnify and glorify the Lord, just to be out on his own and go wherever the Lord gives him an opportunity to sing. That's what James does, and we're so glad to have him at this camp meeting service and to be able to present him to all of you. Would you help me welcome tonight James Blackwood. God bless you, James. We love you. Evangelist Paul Olson is here tonight. and He told me today that tonight he is going to preach on the rapture. I'm anxious to hear this great message, and I know it's going to bless your heart tonight. And uh, before he comes to bring us this message tonight, I want to sing a song that is in keeping with this thought, He's Coming Soon.
believe it, but you just raise your hands and praise the Lord and worship him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, we do believe you're coming soon. And we are ready and watching and waiting for that hour. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your coming back to catch away those who are waiting for you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Just praise the Lord and worship him. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you tonight. We worship you, Lord. We are looking and waiting for that day. The trump of God shall sound. We shall come for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Thank you, Jay. God bless you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, we're looking forward to that day, aren't we? Praise God. And as James mentioned, it's our privilege to have evangelist Paul Olson as our camp meeting speaker for this week. Paul has uh, been a pastor for a number of years and uh, has in late had a tremendous ministry to various parts of the world. One specifically in the West Indies, the French speaking area of the West Indies. He's on radio twice a day there. He's received mail from 42 countries as a result of his ministry. And God has blessed him in a, in a tremendous way. And we're so happy to have him bring the word of God to us in this service. And I know he has a, a message that will be a real challenge to our hearts. Would you help me welcome Paul Olson to Camp Meeting <laughs> USA. God bless you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. You know, Dee and I have just gotten cable into our house in Minneapolis. Uh, we, we just haven't had it. And uh, camp meeting, well, she's watching tonight. Hi, babe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, one thing that has blessed Dee so often is you. I mean, you're just one of those guys around PTL. Who, who has, an, has an ability to get us to sing. You know, Paul, sometimes we don't feel like singing. Of course, that's a time when we need to just open up and worship the Lord. And you, you, you've caused Dee and I, we've sat there and bawled in our living room. And uh, thank you so much. God bless Paul Farron. And, uh, oh, I was going to say... I was going to say, God bless Marge, and she already left Wherever the organ. Wherever she is. Wherever she is. God bless her. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you God so much. You. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What a delight to be here with you tonight. Isn't it great to be at PTL? Oh, it is. Tonight, I, I feel real led of the Lord to preach to you a message on the rapture. Now, we all understand that that word does not appear anywhere in the Bible. The word rapture is a word that has been coined by theologians, I don't know when, but it refers to Jesus Christ and his promise to meet his bride. He is the bridegroom, we as the church of Jesus Christ are the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. And, and the word seems to promise us that we're going to meet our bridegroom. And that catching up of the bride of Christ theologians have coined as the rapture of the Church of Christ. And I want to speak to you about that tonight. Now, if you have your Bibles, I hope you'll get them out. You, you folks at home, get out your Bibles, please. Uh, the reason we preachers quote Bible text is so that you folks, if you doubt what we're saying, can look it up and see for yourself if it's there. And I've got news for you, dear hearts. I think we need to do more of it these days. Don't you? Come on, now you check up on us preachers and see if we're telling you the truth. Turn in your Bibles with me tonight to the book of Matthew, chapter 24, beginning with verse 36. Matthew, chapter 24, beginning with verse 36. Here is a passage of Scripture concerning the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. But of that day and hour knoweth no, na no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, 
so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would have come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. I have heard some people incorrectly refer to this as the so-called secret uh, catching up of the Bride of Christ. There will be nothing secret about it. The Bible does not indicate that this will be a secret catching up. The Bible indicates that this will be a surprise catching up. When it happens, the world's going to know it happened. And I have a feeling it's going to surprise the world to discover how many there are of us who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and are waiting for the, re the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're going to miss us in this world when we're gone. How many plan to be gone? Let me see your hands. Oh, hallelujah. The Bible seems to indicate that this is a surprise catching up. That's why Jesus said, you don't know what hour this is going to happen. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Two shall be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would have come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. James, I've heard that song sung a few times. Please wait a little longer, sweet Jesus. There's so many still wandering out in sin. What are they talking about? Lord, hold it off just a little longer so that we can win a few more of our family. We don't want our house to be broken. We don't want the family circle to be broken. We want everyone in our home to be ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. I'm a Bible prophecy teacher. Uh, I love to preach on Bible prophecy. And, and, and I'm telling people wherever I go, with the knowledge that I have, I believe that the next major world event to take place is going to be the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. I believe that we are living on the brink of that hour when the trump of God shall sound, that dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them and meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I believe we're living on the brink of that moment. Now, the Word tells us who Christ is coming for in this so-called rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. Again, I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, and we want to take a look at verse 27. Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 27. Here in this passage, Paul the Apostle is likening the bride of your house, sir, as to the bride of Christ. And as the man is the head of the house, so Christ is the head of his bride. Now here's what he says about his bride, that he might present unto himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now if you ask me, who is Jesus Christ coming for? The word of God tells you he is coming for a holy church. He's coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. We are living, I believe with all of my heart, in an hour when the Holy Spirit is going forth as a John the Baptist in the wilderness, crying out throughout the land, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And one thing I believe that the Holy Spirit is doing in the church of Jesus Christ today is he is cleaning up his church. I will tell you that as we go across this land, and it doesn't matter which denomination or, <laughs> like the little kid said to his buddy one day, which abomination do you belong to, you know? <laughs> no, I don't think it matters which abomination or denomination that you belong to. 
I believe that the Holy Spirit is working in all the denominations across this land today, and he is doing the same thing. He is heralding to his church, it's time to clean up. It's time, church, to get holy. It's time, church, to stop your sinning. It's time, church, to clean up your act. And I believe with all of my heart that if the church will not respond to the beckoning call of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit's going to come in and clean up our acts for us. Hello? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there is a reason why all of America is in shock today. I believe that behind it all is the Holy Spirit of God saying it is time for the entire body of Jesus Christ to get rid of the spots and to get rid of the wrinkles and to get your robes washed in the blood of the Lamb and to get ready for the greatest hour that planet Earth has ever seen and that is the hour when Jesus Christ calls his church home. Come on now, give me an amen. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 27. That he might present unto himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, if I take my PTL parallel Bible and look over here in the Living Bible translation, that word blemish comes out something like this. Without having a single fault without having a single fault. You know, my friends, the world is pointing their fingers at the entire body of Jesus Christ. And the world is finding a lot of faults with the church. Isn't it shameful that the world has to do this? But ladies and gentlemen, I believe the injunction that we find from the Holy Scriptures here is that the church should get rid of every fault it has that it should be holy and without any blemishes whatsoever. That is the church of Jesus Christ that he is coming for again. And that's what he wants us to be. I believe that this is so important, ladies and gentlemen, that you un and I understand this. I was thinking this morning as I lay in my bed about 6.30 a.m. meditating on this service tonight, and God brought to me the story of Moses. You know, Moses was divinely ordained of God, I believe, even before he was conceived, to be the liberator of the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Think of all the miracles that God performed in the life of Moses. While Pharaoh was killing every Jewish male child under one year of age, uh, one years of age, and a whale was rising up from the slave camps of Egypt as little baby boys were torn from their mother's arms, swords driven through their little hearts and their bodies thrown into the Nile River. One Jewish mother could not bear it. And the Bible says she took her precious little baby and she built herself a little ark and passed it with mud. You know the story as well as I do. Haven't you all been to Sunday school? And she put little baby Moses in the bulrushes. And then God sent the princes of Egypt, the sister of Pharaoh, down there to bathe in the muddy uh, Nile River. Why anybody want to bathe in that dirty old thing, I'll never know. But they sure, there she was. And, and when she waded out into the waters, God blew ever so gently. And the little ark began to float down the river. And when the little ark got in a parallel position with the princes of Egypt, I believe God reached into that little ark and pinched baby Moses on his bottom and made him cry. <laughs> yes, and, and, and the princess of Egypt heard it, and she said, bring it to me. And when she opened it, this is the, you, you have to understand the Middle East. I've been in Israel now 33 times, people. I know that part of the world. You have to understand what a miracle this is. God, I believe, touched with his finger the heart of an Egyptian princess, and she loved a Jewish baby. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that Miriam, his older sister, who was watching off there in the side, came running and said, how would you like to have a Jewish mother to, uh, 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 to suckle this baby for you? Now, you girls realize you didn't have Similex back in those days. Hello? 
and, 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 and the princess of Egypt said yes. And so she went and got her mother. And the mother of Moses carried her own baby under the protection of Pharaoh into the palace of Egypt and suckled her own baby. Now, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. There is no doubt about it. Cecil B. DeMille, the great motion prediction producer from Hollywood, spent over $13 million producing the movie. He spent over $3 million just researching the life of Moses. And he has got data that you don't find in your Bible. Moses was trained in the finest universities of the Middle East. He became a great architect and built many of the cities of Egypt. He was the favorite of Pharaoh to become the next Pharaoh of the land over his half-brother, Ramses II. Can you imagine Moses walking around the, 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 the palace in Egypt saying, wow, is God ever terrific? Here I am a Jew and nobody knows it. And I'm the favorite to become the next Pharaoh and nobody knows it. And I'm a Jew. And when I become Pharaoh, all I will do is make a decree according to the law of the Medes and the Persians and I'll set the Jews free and the slaves can go home. Wow, is God terrific? Well, folks, that's when the mud hit the fan. Do you know that Moses got so close to becoming the Pharaoh? And then everything went into reverse. He was found out. He was disposed from, deposed from Egypt. He was stripped of his royal Egyptian heritage. He was rejected by his own people. He was banished to the desert. And there wasted for 40 years until he became an 80-year-old man. Oh, my pop's sitting down there, Dad. He, he was four years younger than you. You're 84 years old. Moses was an 80-year-old grandpa. And then God says, now I'm ready to use you. I want to tell you folks something. There was one problem with Moses. He had too much of Egypt inside of him for God to use. And I want to make one point about Moses tonight. Before God could use Moses, he did not have to get Moses out of Egypt. What God had to do was get Egypt out of Moses. Egypt symbolically represents the land of sin. And God says, I've got to get him out. I've got to get Egypt out of Moses. I've got to stick him out there in the desert until he becomes a holy man of God. People look at me. I believe with all my heart that's what God is doing in the church today. He is purifying his body. He is purifying his servants. He is saying, I'm going to get Egypt out of my servants until my men rise up and become mighty, holy men of God, possessed of the Spirit of God and emptied of this world. Hello! I believe with all of my heart. That is what God is going to do. Now, the question is, how does God get Egypt out of his men? Well, I think we better take a look at this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. How does he, God get Egypt out of any one of us? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. Take a look at it. He said, the word says, my son, don't be angry when the Lord punishes you. Don't be discouraged when he has to show you where you are wrong. I'm, I'm reading from the Living Bible. When he punishes you, it proves that he loves you. When, listen to this, when he whips you, it proves that you are really his child. Let God train you, for he is doing what any loving father does for his children. Who ever heard of a son who has never been corrected? If God doesn't punish you when you need it, as other fathers punish their sons, then it means that you aren't really God's son at all. Now, if you want to know what it says in the King James translation, take a look at it. God says in the King James translation, if God doesn't punish you, it means that you are bastards. That's exactly what it says in the Bible. That you don't really belong to his family. Since we respect our fathers here on earth, though they punish us, should we not all the more cheerfully submit to God's training so that we can really begin to live? I'm going to tell you something beautiful about what is going on in the body of Jesus Christ today. I believe that God is rooting out sin. I believe with all of my heart that God is getting his bride ready. 
and by punishing us when we are wrong and showing us and exposing us when we are wrong, it proves to us one thing, that we are not, as the Bible says, bastards, but that we are really sons of God. When God purges us, come on people, when God cleanses us, when God uh, rebukes us, it proves one thing, that we are his children. Hallelujah, that we are his church. And it's not negative, it is positive. I believe that if those of you in the body of Jesus Christ will just be patient. Shut your mouths. I had a reporter come up to me in the hotel lobby and said, Brother, Mr. are you Mr. Alsa? Yes. She said, I want to interview. I said, that's too bad for you. I have nothing whatsoever to say. I've had reporters call me in Minneapolis from cities all over this country. We want to talk to you about PTF. I have nothing to say. This is none of their business. I'll tell you something, honey, that God loves his church. God loves his preachers. God loves his servants. James Blackwood, God loves his gospel singers. Hallelujah. And God says, I'm going to get my church ready. And when I rebuke my church, and when I reprove my church of sin, it proves one thing, that they are my children, and I love them, and I'm getting them ready. Woo! I just feel like jumping and shouting here tonight. I believe that this is God. Come on, somebody say me amen. Well, now, when you see all of this happening, it makes you ask one question. Are there any holy men left? Have you ever asked that question? Do you know that Elijah was a great prophet of God? And in 1 Kings, I believe it's chapter 19, verse 18, you find this. In fact, it is 1 Kings, chapter 19, verse 18. Do you know that King Ahab had married him? So he did what God said, don't do. The Word of God says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And he disobeyed God, and he unequally yoked together himself with uh, a Baal-worshipping woman. I've never heard a mother anywhere in this world name her daughter after this woman. You know what her name was? Jezebel. Honey, she was a bad one. She had such influence over the prophets of God that thousands of God's prophets turned from Jehovah and began to worship Baal. They tore down the altars of God and put up altars. Of, you know, one day Elijah said to the Lord, Lord, I'm the only one left. Have y'all ever felt that way sometimes? Come on. Dad, you and I have talked about this a few times. Is there anybody left? Is there anybody left that is worthy of our trust? Is there anybody left that we can believe in? That's what Elijah said. Is there anyone left? You know, what, you know what the Lord said to Elijah in verse 18, chapter 19 of 1 Kings? The Lord said to Elijah, Elijah, be of co good comfort. There are 7,000 of my people who have not bowed their knees to Baal. Hallelujah! And I'm encouraged when I read that. People look at me. Don't give up. Don't give up on TV preachers. Hallelujah. I got news for you. The media is wrong. They would have you to think that they're all rotten. I got news for you, the media is wrong. Hallelujah. There, all the preachers in America, all the pastors in America, I'm an evangelist, all the evangelists in America are not corrupt and rotten and filthy and sinful. Hello? God has his army. Hallelujah. If there were 7,000 in Israel 2,000 years ago, I'm going to tell you, honey, that there are tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands who have not bow their knees to the bale of this world. You can trust it. Hallelujah. People don't give up on TV ministry. Don't do that. Is there any future for the electronic church? How do you better believe it? It's going to be better than it's ever been before because it's going to be cleaner. <laughs> Hallelujah. I believe that. And right people don't lose your faith in TV evangelists or pastors across this country. I got news for you. There are hundreds and thousands of them that have not bowed their knees to the God of Baal of this world. Hallelujah. Don't give up. 
Don't give up. Hallelujah. I'm going to give you one more verse of Scripture, and then I'm going to close. I turn your attention to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Take a look at it. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Paul, do you believe in that stuff? With all my heart. Honey, if you can believe in Star Wars, you can believe in the rapture. Hello? One morning, my mama, who was buried when I was 14 years old, whose body's already decomposed and got back, back to dust, is going to respond to the trumpet of Gabriel. And that earth is going to upheaval itself. Hallelujah. And that old rusty coffin hinge is going to squeak open, Dad. And Mama, Rock number Marie Olson is going to rise from the dead. That corruption is going to rise in incorruption. That mortality is going to rise in immortality. We're going to see Mama again. We believe in it so much, we put on our tombstone, Jesus, the resurrection and the life. I never cried so hard when they buried Mama. And I cried out, Mama, I'll see you on resurrection morning. I believe that, people, with all my heart. I believe in the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you a question. If it took place tonight, where would that leave you? How about you folks at home? Are you ready for the coming of Jesus Christ? I'm going to tell you something. There's a number that you can call right now on your screen. And on the other end of that line is someone who can tell you how to get ready for the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. There's only one thing that will keep you from it, and that is your sin. There's only one thing that can separate you from God, and that is your sin. Come on, everybody in this place, say it with me. My sin, say it. Separates me from my God. That's what your sin does. But Jesus said that if you'll confess your sin, he'll forgive you. Someone on that phone line, someone on that line can help you right now find Jesus Christ and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Will you pick up your phone and call them now? Do it. Hallelujah. Well, friends, as we leave Camp Meeting at this time, Camp Meeting USA was produced at Heritage USA, located just south of Charlotte, North Carolina, off Interstate 77.